In this series, we're going to take a look at how to make your WordPress site faster. Some of the things we'll take a look at will include image manipulation, both manual and automatic, browser-side caching, as well as server-side caching. Some of the things we'll look at will be things that you don't necessarily need to do yourself, but rather you'll have your system administrator do for you or your host. Some of the things we'll look at will be manual items things you need to do every time you make a post or an image or whatever. And some of them will be automatic, things you can set and forget and they'll just make your site faster forever. Not all of the things we'll look at will be limited to WordPress. They're things that will make any website faster. You don't need to do everything that we're going to cover here, but any of the items we cover here will make your site a little bit faster. And in the end, you should see your site loading much faster. In this session we're going to talk about how to make WordPress cache versions of your site so that it can serve them more quickly. Every time you load the front end of your WordPress site, it does many, many database calls, pulls together a bunch of different assets, compiles them into web pages, and then sends them out the door. This is very time consuming. Ideally, you would have plain static HTML files that are just sitting there waiting to be tossed out the door by your server. These caching plugins can help make those static files out of your WordPress site. We're going to take a look at several of them. If you simply go to WordPress.org and search for cache, you'll see that there are 1787 plugins. And some of these are actual caching plugins, and some of them are helpers. There's Quick Cache, W3 Total Cache, WP Super Cache, Bodio's Easy Cache, AIO Cache and Performance, etc. There are many, many, many versions of these, but they all do essentially the same thing. They create plain HTML files out of your site. The big two are WP Super Cache and W3 Total Cache. And then third, Bad Cache was created and is used by Automatic on WordPress.com, so we know it's very good. It's slightly slower than the others, though, because it is tuned for their specific use. My favorite is WP Super Cache, and that's the one we're going to take a look at today. Before I install it, I want to show you something. This is my WP content folder, and here are its contents. There's an index.php file, which actually has nothing. It's just there to prevent people from browsing this folder. There are my plugins, my themes, an upgrade folder, and an uploads folder. Uploads holds all my images and only gets used during upgrades. But this is where our cache is going to live, so we'll come back and look at this in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and install WP Super Cache. And here at the top it says WP Super Cache is enabled on your website. To make sure rename WP login.php works correctly, you should add CV login to rejected URIs. This notice will disappear once you've done that correctly. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. And here we have WP Super Cache is disabled. Please go to the plugin admin page to enable caching. So it's installed and activated, but is not actually being used yet. I could use this link, but I want to show you that the same link is under Settings, WP Super Cache. Now it just told us that it added the WP Cache constant to wpconfig.php, and it tells what to do if we continue to see this. Now we're going to turn caching on. There. Now it's on. Now let's take a look at our WP Content folder. Now we have some new things. We have a file called advanced-cache.php and wp-cache-config.php as well as a folder called cache. I'm not going to get into what's inside these files. They're basically some configuration items for caching for WordPress. Our cache is going to live inside the cache folder. So let's take a look there. We have blogs and meta. Now WordPress is using this folder to cache things. But WP Super Cache can enhance it greatly. Let's go back and take a look there. Now the first thing we want to do is go to Advanced. And right at the top, cache hits to this website for quick access. That's what we want. We want this to be cached. And here we can choose in what manner we cache things. 
the default is to use PHP. One of the things we're trying to avoid is actually spinning up PHP, which is kind of slow. What we want to use is mod rewrite. So I'm going to choose that, and then I'll make that setting a little lower down. But first, let's look at some miscellaneous things. Here's an option to compress pages so they're served more quickly to visitors. Recommended. It says compression is disabled by default because some hosts have problems with compressed files. This is true. I've had problems in the past. However, it is recommended, and I recommend that you do it. So I'm going to turn that on. The problem you might see is that your server will not serve your web page at all. So it'll be quite obvious that that's the problem. Now there's an option for 304 not modified browser caching. This actually is going to be disabled once we switch to mod rewrite. So we don't want that. Don't cache pages for known users. And it says logged in users and those that comment. This makes it so that people who are logged in get the absolute latest and your average drive-by user will get the cached version. I'm going to do that. Then, don't cache pages with get parameters, like x equals y at the end of a URL. With WordPress, these typically only come up with search queries. I like having those cached, though, so we're going to leave that off. Make known users anonymous so they're served super cache static files. I'm going to leave that off because I've already checked don't cache for known users. And then cache rebuild, serve a super cache file to anonymous users while a new file is being generated. I'm going to leave that on as well. And I'm not going to put the notice in the footer. And then here we have some advanced options. I rarely change these from the defaults. For example, enable dynamic caching, which requires PHP or legacy. Since I'm not using those, I don't care. Mobile device support, that's good stuff. Then you can remove UTF-8 blog care set support from .ht access files. Only necessary if you see odd characters or punctuation looks incorrect. So we can leave that off until we have a problem. Clear all cache files when a post or page is published or updated. This would completely wipe out the cache for your entire site, and it would have to rebuild the entire site if we did this. Extra home page checks. Very occasionally stops home page from caching. Recommended. I'm going to leave that off actually. My home page doesn't change often enough. If your home page changes very frequently, then you should turn it on. Only refresh current page when comments are made. That means that even if you updated your post, it would not refresh the cache unless there was a comment made. We don't want that because if you change your post, you want the new one to go up. List the newest cache pages on this page. I don't need to see them here course file locking, you probably don't need this. And late in it, most useful in legacy mode. Again, we don't care. There's a do not cache page secret key here, and we'll go over that later. So now I'm going to update my status. And that saved everything I did here. Now there's a notice here. The rewrite rules required by this plugin have changed or are missing. Scroll down the advanced settings page and click the update mod rewrite rules button. And those will be very obvious. And there they are. So all of this stuff in the yellow box is going to get written to our .ht access file. This is where some of the magic comes in for caching. So I just hit this button and now they're there. So I didn't actually have to do much. So now caching is happening. I'm going to open up our page in a new tab. and we'll take a look at our cache folder. And now there's less. This is actually expected because over here we are a known user. We're logged in. So what I really want to do is use the privacy mode of my browser or use a different browser. There, now I'm in private mode in Firefox. Now when I go there, I am an unknown user. Now let's take a look here. Now I have a folder called Supercache. Let's look in there. And now there's a folder for this site. If I were running a multi-site version of WordPress, then you would see more than one site here. Let's look inside here. 
And here we have index.html and index.html.gz. The .gz version is the compressed version. If we look at the file sizes, you can see that index.html is 8.7k, whereas index.html.gz is 2.7k. That's much, much smaller. So now, when someone comes to the site that is not logged in, they're getting a 2.7 kilobyte file sent out instantly, rather than building all of WordPress from all the database calls and compiling all the CSS files and then sending it out the door. That's fantastic. We'll continue looking at this plugin in the next session. In the last session, we ended by setting up mod rewrite to serve the cached files. We still have two warnings at the top here. Let's take a look at the first one. This warning actually does not come from WP Supercache, but rather another plugin called rename wp-login.php. I used that one to create a different login page, and it's telling me that I should set that one to not be cached. So I'm going to copy this, and then there's a link here to rejected URIs, which is actually just down the page right here. We'll use the link so I can show you how it gets there. And there we are. So this says, add here strings, not a file name, that forces a page not to be cached. For example, if your URLs include year and you don't want to cache last year posts, it's enough to specify the year, i.e. slash 2004 slash. WP cache will search if that string is part of the URI and if so, we'll not cache that page. So I'm simply going to put in my string here. Now the ones that were there before, wp dash asterisk backslash dot php, make it so that if you specifically go to a file like wp dash config dot php, it won't cache it. And the same holds true for index dot php. WordPress will never send you to an index dot php file and so you don't want to cache it. So now let's go back up and I'll click on the advanced tab to reload this page and now that warning at the top is gone. The next one says garbage collection is configured right on this page and similar to the other error message there's a link to go directly to it in this page. Now garbage collection means getting rid of old cached files you don't necessarily want your cache files to live forever because your content is going to change and you want that reflected in your cache and so you can set up a schedule to say I want to get rid of my cache files based on a certain criteria so let's take a look here cache timeout is 1800 seconds so basically we're saying that our cached files should only live for 30 minutes now this says how long should cached pages remain fresh? Set to zero to disable garbage collection. A good starting point is 3600 seconds. That's an hour. Now this varies entirely upon the kind of content you have. If you have a site that does not change very often, you actually want to set this pretty high, maybe 24 hours. If you have a site that changes quite frequently, like many times per hour, you may want to set this very low, or perhaps even delete garbage collection because your cache will flush itself in other ways. If you have a normal average blog where you post a couple times a week, then 3600 is probably a good number. So we're going to set it to that. Then we have the scheduler. We can check for cached files every 600 seconds or at a certain time of day or on an interval. So the cache timeout says your file will only be valid for an hour. That doesn't mean it goes away after an hour. It means that the next time WordPress checks, it will be considered invalid. The scheduler is how often it checks. Now we have the cache timeout set to an hour and the interval set to hourly. But we could also set it to twice daily or once daily. I'm going to leave it at once hourly. So once an hour, it's going to go to my cache folder and look for old files. If it finds them, it will flush them. 
we can optionally have WordPress email us every time garbage collection runs, and it sends some information about what it's flushing. This gets pretty old because the messages are pretty similar every time. So really only turn this on if something's not right and you need to see what's going on. And if you need to get fine-grained and really be careful about how garbage collection happens, I strongly recommend you read this. I'm going to click Change Expiration. And there, now my garbage collection is set properly. So now I will click Advanced and my garbage collection error is gone. So now let's scroll down and see what other options we have here. This is the update for the top block that we did in the other video. Here are our mod rewrite rules. Here's garbage collection. And here we have accepted file names and rejected URIs. We can choose to not cache the following page types. Single posts, pages, the front page, the home, archives, tags, category, feeds, search pages, or author pages. Honestly, I can't think of a reason you would want to do any of these except possibly the search page because that can change as the results of each search change. So just for fun, I will click that one. There. The next session is the rejected strings, which we covered earlier. And then here we have file names that can be cached even if they match one of the following rejected substrings specified above. So we have here reject wp-whatever. But we actually do want to cache WP comments pop-up and the links OPML and the locations. So this overrides what's above. Then rejected user agents. Strings in the HTTP user agent header that prevent WP cache from caching bot, spiders, and crawlers request. Note that super cache files are still sent to these agents if they already exist. So imagine for a moment that you've just turned on caching but no one has visited your site and so you actually don't have a cache yet. Suddenly Googlebot shows up and hits every page on your site. Right now it would not create a cache because it is part of a bot. I actually don't prefer this behavior. I would like Google to go through, hit every page, and create a cache file of every page for me. That way when a human comes the cache is already there. So I actually remove all of these. Now this is completely up to you. You may not want this behavior. Then here we have lockdown. This prepares your server for an unexpected spike in traffic by enabling the lockdown. When this is enabled, new comments on a post will not refresh the cached static files. By default, if someone comes to your cached post and makes a comment, it flushes that cache. Then the next person who comes along creates a new cache file. If you had an extraordinarily popular post and you had hundreds of thousands of people, then this would essentially make it so that there was never a cache file because people would be reloading too fast. Lockdown prevents that. However, that also makes it so that new comments don't make it to the front page. So then you need to set your garbage collection quite low so that it flushes it on a schedule so that people can see the new comments as they come in. I have never actually enabled lockdown on any site. Then we have a section here called directly cached files. Let's say you upload an HTML file that you built in Windows Notepad, not related to WordPress whatsoever. You could enter its file name in this field right here and submit query and it would start caching that page, even though it's not part of WordPress. I've never used this either, but it's nice to know that it's there. And at the bottom is fixed configuration. If you screw things up so bad that you don't even know what you're doing anymore, click this big button at the bottom and you will start over. That's it for the advanced settings. The settings that I've provided in here are the default ones that I prefer. Sometimes I set garbage collection much higher on a slow moving site, but that's about it. We'll take a look at the rest of the tabs in another video. In this session, we're gonna wrap up our look at WP Supercache, making your site faster. The next tab on our list here is called CDN, which stands for Content Delivery Network. 
We're not going to get too deep into how to set up a CDN in this series, but I wanted to show you what's available in WP SuperCache. Basically, you can enable it and then provide some information about where your CDN is. A CDN allows you to keep some parts of your site on a server different from your own, typically things like images and CSS files, etc. Some common services are Amazon CloudFront, Max CDN, and Cloudflare. Cloudflare actually makes a really excellent WordPress plugin. You see these pinpoints on the map. Basically, your site gets mirrored to each of those pinpoints so that when someone near one of them requests your site, it goes there instead of pulling it from your server. This gets your content out but greatly reduces load on your own server. Next, let's look at the Contents tab. Here we can regenerate these stats, which say how much data is in your WP cache and how much data is in your WP Super Cache. Your WP cache is created by WordPress, but Super Cache is created by this plugin. It says we have one cached pages, and we can list here that it's this one, and it tells you how old it is in seconds. Then you have the option to delete the entire cache or only expired pages. Next is the preload button. The preload button goes through your site as if it were a browser and creates a cache of every page. If you have a very large site, this can be very time consuming and it might be better to let your end users build the cache for you as things are required. However, if your traffic is low and it's not going to annoy anyone to have a bot going through and clicking everything, this can preload your cache so that humans get your cache faster. I'm going to choose preload mode, which means garbage collection only on legacy cache files. I'm going to preload my tags, categories, and other taxonomies, but I don't want an email every time something happens. So I'm just going to click preload cache now. There it says scheduled preloading of cache in 10 seconds. I can go somewhere else and come back and it will be done. Next is the plugins tab. These are plugins that WP SuperCache can help with. There's awaiting moderation for comments, bad behavior for blocking attacks, domain mapping, Jetpack mobile theme, and WP Touch. You can turn these on if you use those plugins. Lastly, there's debug, and this can help figure out what's going on if things aren't working. I'm going to go back to my preload and see how that's going. It's still working. So let's go to Contents, Regenerate Cache Stats, and now it says I have six cached pages, which shows that the preload is working. So now let's go to Debug going to enable it. I'm going to put in my own IP address. That way it's not doing the debugging for everyone who comes to the site, only for me. And then optionally display comments at the end of every page like this. Here are some things that we can choose to do if we're really stuck and we can't figure out what's going on. We can check the front page every five minutes. We can have it search for some text. We can clear the cache on every error. Or we can email the blog admin when checks are made. I'm going to leave those off and hit save. And now, because I turned on debugging, it tells me that I can look at this file to see the log. So I'll open that in a new tab. And it's not found. That's because it hasn't been created yet by a problem. Let's see if we can create it by going to a page. There. No errors, so no log file. But if there was something going wrong, then I would be able to see this file and it would list for us what file was having problems being cached and what the error was. I'm going to turn it off now so that it doesn't run forever. Debugging can slow things down a little bit. So that's it for WP SuperCache. 
Other caching plugins have different or more features. W3 Total Cache has quite a few more features, but I tend to prefer to keep functionality small within plugins. I'd rather have more plugins that do single things than one plugin that does many. In this session, we're going to talk about how to optimize your images for file size using WordPress only rather than a piece of software like Photoshop. You may recall from our Photoshop session that JPEGs have a percentage of quality from 0 to 100 percent. You may also recall that when you upload an image to WordPress, it creates multiple sizes. By default, the quality on those new sizes is 90 percent, but often it can be lowered. There are several plugins that can help with that. One is called the U Image Optimizer, and another is WP Smush It. I'm a fan of WP Smush It, so we're going to go over that one. It uses a service from Yahoo to compress images. So when you run it, it sends the image to Yahoo, it gets compressed, and then comes back. All within the automatic upload system in WordPress. So you don't actually have to do anything. Let's do some experiments and see how it works. I do not have it activated right now, so I'm going to upload an image. And then we'll look at it. This says the file size is 500k. I actually have it already installed. I'm just going to activate it. Now if I go to the media library, on the right here it says not processed. Smush it now. I'll just click that. There. It was reduced by 7.2%. That may not sound like a lot, but if you have many images, it can really add up. Now over here is Bulk Smush It, and you can say, do all of my images right now. I only have the one image, so this isn't going to do anything. But say you had hundreds of images already, and now that it's installed, it does it during upload. Let's actually delete this one, and then re-add it. and there you can see it's already smushed. So after you install it, you don't have to do anything at all. Every time you upload an image, it gets automatically compressed. This is pretty important because images can be the largest things on your website, and the more you can reduce their file size, the faster your site will load. This is also significant because images are usually not enhanced by a server-side cache, nor are they typically compressed by the caching software. So where you might get a plain HTML file for a web page or a gzipped version for a CSS file, images are just images and the server's not going to do much for them. So anything you can do ahead of time to make them smaller and faster is going to greatly enhance your download speed. Something else that can dramatically help you with image downloads is using the appropriate dimensions in your page. Let me show you what I mean. Here in my page, I'm going to add media. I have this flower, and I can choose sizes. Thumbnail, 150 by 150, medium, 300 by 200, large, 604 by 402, and full size, 1800 by 1200. I'm going to choose full size. There. Now it's right in my post. I'll hit publish, and then we'll view the page. There. It looks great, right? Except the image itself is actually much larger than this. It's actually this big. Then when I remove my browser zoom, you can see that it's actually this big. So let's take a look here. This image is actually 464K. Now let's go back and edit this, and instead of the full size, we'll add simply large, and we'll view it again. There, it looks the same. 
However, if we view the image and remove the zoom, you can see that it's much, much smaller. And we view the image info, it's only 47K. That's 400K smaller. Now this one actually is still much too large. We really only want to see it this big. So let's try it again. Now that's pretty small actually. Let's view the page. And it is quite small. However, if we go to view image, you can see it's really that small. If we view image info, you can see that it's only 13K. That's enormously smaller than the original one. Now there are also plugins to allow you to change the sizes of these images. Here you can see our options are 150 by 150, 300 by 300, and 1024 by 1024. You can change these numbers and you can also add new sizes given the right plugin. So as you insert images, think about the size that the end user needs to see and try to serve just that size rather than the full size and you can make your pages load much, much faster. In this session, we're going to talk about how you, as a web developer, can leverage the browser cache of your end users. Every time someone visits a page or looks at an image, the browser keeps a copy of it. Then if you request that page again within a certain amount of time, rather than run out to the internet to grab a new copy, it just gives you the locally saved one. This makes the internet feel much faster. Let's take a look at what that looks like inside Firefox. If you go to Preferences, Advanced, Network, there's a section here called Cached Web Content. And right now I have 37 megabytes of disk space cached. I can optionally clear it so that I'm sure to get the latest from whatever site I'm visiting, or I can override Automatic Cache Management and limit it to a specific number. I'm going to go ahead and clear it now. And now it's using only 18K. And I'll close this. This is a picture my daughter drew. And right now, even though it's sitting here and we're looking at it, I haven't reloaded so it's not in cache. So I'm going to reload. And now it should be in cache. So let's go back to Firefox, Preferences, and it says we have 197k of disk space and that's that image. Now the length of time that your browser will keep an image can be set in a variety of ways. Your browser has its own rules built in but those can be overrided given a directive from the server and I'm going to show you how to override that so that your things can be cached longer when appropriate. First I'm going to right click on this image and go to view image info. I'm going to take a look at the headers. Here are the request headers. These are the things that I asked the server for. And here are the response headers. This is what the server sent back. The response is 200 OK, which means it found the image, the date of the request, the server, when the image was last modified, an e tag, which helps uniquely identify this image, accept ranges or bytes, content length, which is the size of the image. MS author via has Dave, which means Dave is turned on on the server. Irrelevant to us. Keep alive, timeout 2, max 100. That's how long the server will take to try sending stuff back to you. And the content type is image JPEG. Notice we didn't see anything in here about caching. That's because the server hasn't said anything about it. And we're going to change that. My favorite place to get this information is from gtmetrics.com. They have this excellent tutorial on how to leverage browser caching. But right here in the middle is the magic. We're going to take this information and we're going to put it into our site's HT access file. My whole folder here is full of all kinds of things. But what we really want is just the HT access file. Most operating systems in their file system 
have a prefix before the dot. In this case, it begins with only a dot. The things we're going to put into this file today aren't dependent on any CMS. They work just fine on a static site or WordPress or Drupal or Joomla or anything. Depending on what you have installed on your site, you may already have things inside .htaccess, and that's fine. What we're going to put in it can go at the end or the beginning. Let's do that now. You can edit this file in any text editor. I happen to like this one. So I'm going to paste it right there. And now let's take a look at what it's saying. It's looking for a module on the server called mod expires. Most servers have this by default. If it has it, it turns expires active on. And then there are a list of directives here. Expires by type. And let's take a look at these first. JPG, JPEG, GIF, and PNG all have an expire date now of access time plus one year. So basically one year from the first access. Now this assumes that your images, once they're uploaded and in place, are not going to change within a year. If this is not the case, you need to change these values. But for most people, one year works just fine. And what this is doing is telling the browser, keep this image locally for a year, unless the end user decides to flush their entire cache, which is another story. Then we have another set here. CSS, PDF, JavaScript, and Flash files for one month. They're assuming that these files are going to change about once a month. But again, if that's wrong, you can go ahead and change it and make it be anything you want. Then there's one called XICON, and this would be like a fav icon for your website. And then the default for everything else is two days. So it assumes that your content itself might change as often as every two days. And again, if that's wrong, go ahead and change it to set it to be anything you like here. So now I'm going to save this. I'm going to reload my image. And now let's look at our image info. We go over to headers. And in the response headers, now we have at the bottom here, cache control max age and these are seconds so that's an awful lot of seconds but it basically says this image isn't going to change for that many seconds so browser rather than run out and get it simply reload it so now if I reload it doesn't run out to the server it grabs it from my hard drive and it's actually quite fast now if you need to be absolutely sure you're getting the latest it's possible to hold the shift key while you reload and it ignores your local cache and runs out to get the latest from the server. That's handy for you as a developer to be sure you know you're getting the latest. And you can see how much longer it took. Here's the local version reloading very quickly. If I hold shift and do it again, it has to go get it. So in summary, we took these HT access rules and put them in dot HD access and said to the browser, these are the time limits you should have for caching for these types of items. And then your browser will pay attention to those. Now, as I showed you with the shift key and emptying cache manually, you can flush all that and you can start over. And so this isn't going to guarantee that your end users are going to use these things forever. They can ignore them if they wish, but most people don't. And putting them in place can greatly speed up your website. In this session, we're going to look at several things that, again, are not tied specifically to WordPress, but could apply to any website. The first thing we're going to look at is crawl rate. This red text here at the top of the page is very important. We're not talking about how often Google comes to your website to find out if you have new stuff. We're talking about how hard Google hits your site when they're looking for new stuff. So, for example, say one day Google says, hey, we haven't been to Topher's website in a while, Let's go see what he has, and then asks for every page in my entire site at the same time. My server feels like it got hit in the head with a hammer, drops to its knees, and all my regular users say, Hey, Topher, what happened to your website? It's down. I can say to Google, via Webmaster Tools, Don't hit my server that hard. Please only request a certain number of files in a certain amount of time. 
and then Google knows that it shouldn't hit my server so hard and it can come in like a normal user and no one will really notice that Google's in there looking at everything I have. Bing can do the same thing. You create an account on the Bing Webmaster Tools and you set up the crawl rate. This can actually be pretty important because I've had a number of occasions where both Google and Bing came and hit my server at the same time and my server resources ran out of control and I didn't get it back for an hour or so. That's really inconvenient. So I actually recommend that you go to both Google and Bing and any others that you notice crawling your site regularly and try to set a crawl rate. That way they won't bring your server down. Next I'd like to talk about something that I don't think you personally should do, but rather your host or server sysadmin should do. Your server is probably running either Apache or Nginx as the web server. Apache is very large, very old, very common, and very cool. But it is a little bit slow. Nginx is much younger, much newer, and in some instances much faster. When serving a normal PHP page, say a WordPress page, Nginx is not a lot faster. However, when serving a static HTML file, it is much faster. And so if you're using something like WP Supercache to create your static HTML files, then Nginx will be serving those, and it can end up being much, much faster. Another option is to use Nginx as a reverse proxy against Apache. So you can see our flow here. Someone comes in and says, I'd like this web page. Nginx says, do we have a cache? Yes, serve it. And we've never hit Apache. If not, have Apache serve the page and throw it in the cache and then send it out. So each page really only gets hit once by Apache. And then we have Nginx doing its fast stuff. Now there's an excellent tutorial here on how to do it, full of code and system management stuff that I actually personally don't understand. And I don't recommend that you do it yourself, unless you're a sysadmin and you really want to get into this. This is the kind of thing you go to your host and you say, I would like to use Nginx as my web server or I would like to use Nginx as a reverse proxy against Apache so that I can serve my static HTML files faster. If you're on shared hosting, someplace like DreamHost or Bluehost, then they'll probably simply say no because they'd have to configure something special for you, which is the opposite of shared hosting, or do it for everyone, which is a really big job. So this really only applies if you have your own VPS or your own server and you have a sysadmin who runs it for you. If you're on shared hosting and you really need speed and it's very important to you, I strongly recommend you leave shared hosting because you're never going to get any faster than what is given to everyone else. There are lots of places that will do a managed server for you and there are even places that will do managed WordPress hosting for you, in which case you don't need to think about this kind of stuff. So let me sum up my server comments. If you're on shared hosting and speed is important to you, leave shared hosting. Find managed hosting someplace that says we will give you your own server and we will have a system administrator available for you to do what you need. It does cost more, in some cases a lot more, but if speed is really important that's where you need to go. So then you probably want to be running Nginx as your server or Nginx in front of Apache as a reverse proxy. In this series, we looked at a wide variety of things that can make your site faster. Some of them are things you have to do yourself by hand, some things are automated, and some things you shouldn't do yourself at all. As I mentioned in the intro, you don't need to do everything we talked about here. Any of the things I've talked about will make your site somewhat faster. When you do them all, it can really add up to quite a difference. In this session where I talked about Photoshop, I talked about some free software, and I'd like to look at that real quick. Paint.net is for Windows and is actually quite powerful. It can do a lot of the things that Photoshop does, but is free. Another one is called The GIMP. The GIMP runs on all platforms and is also free. I've used it for a number of years and I highly recommend it. We also talked about some things that you should have your host take care of for you. And I'd like to reiterate that if speed is really important, you should not be on shared hosting. The chances that somebody else could be taking up your bandwidth or your system resources 
go way up. If the need for speed is really paramount, then you need your own server, whether it's a virtual server or an actual piece of hardware. There are lots and lots of places that offer this, and my most important piece of advice in finding one of these servers is finding the support that you like. Find people you trust. That's more important than price and more important than their Google ranking. Shop around, talk to the support staff, talk to the sales staff, find somebody you like and go with them.